to this uh, Social Market Foundation and Investment Association for an interesting event. Um, if you haven't met before, I'm James Go. I'm not any longer the director of the Social Market Foundation. I have to remind myself of that. I've left uh, that job in uh, in summer. I'm now a mere, a mere fellow of the SMF um, and doing a job as a partner at Trumpville Teller Advisors, who I am um, a keen supporter of. Uh, centrist policy making in the uh, in the public interest um, and the use of private capital for public good, which is really I suppose, the uh, the theme of this event. Um, uh, before we get to the uh, the thing you're actually here to uh, listen to, I'll just very much do some housekeeping. I think the main things I'm going to tell you are that the door behind you is the fire escape. Um, there are no fire plans. If bells and whistles go off, then you can have a come through that way. Uh, the other thing is that when we come to Q&A, that camera over there, Hello Camera, uh, is currently live streaming this event to the SMF YouTube channel, uh, which means that uh, the audience is not just in the room, it's also the internet. Uh, and when you come to questions, the microphone will pick up your question. Uh, so you're not just talking to the friendly colleagues in the room, you're also talking to uh, people outside the room, and your question will be recorded on for all time, so just bear that one in mind. That's, uh, that's I think, the uh, all, all housekeeping I'm uh, going to do. Um, in terms of uh, regular, I'm, I'm not going to give you long public biographies of the speakers I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but just to uh, remind you who everybody is, we're going to hear first from Chris Kimes from the Fed Association. Uh, he's going to be followed by Emily Shepherd from the Financial Conduct Authority. Uh, the additional mystery guest, on my right, who uh, does not have a name tag because uh, she has added uh, happily uh, late uh, in proceedings. This is Tracy Blackwell, Chief Executive Officer of Pension Insurance Corporation. And our final uh, speaker for the magisterial stirring up some um, uh, range of feet, uh, excited to be here, is Gareth Davis, the Secretary of the Treasury. Uh, so they are all going to be talking about our essay question of the day, which is investing in growth. How to create jobs and simply government by using investment. How do we essentially get more money going into good stuff that does things that we like and makes the country better? So that's our, uh, that's the topic, that's the theme. Um, I'm going to hand over to Chris Cummings who can tell us how, uh, how investment and investment association members, I expect, can make the world better, happier, and more glorious. <laughs> Chris. Thank you, James. Uh, well, no, nothing like a uh, Easy question to begin with, uh, make the world a better place. Um, so, uh, good morning and welcome. Uh, as James said, my name is Chris Cummings, I'm the Chief Executive of the Investment Association. That means we're the representative body for UK based fund managers here uh, in the UK. That's an industry that manages some 10 trillion pounds of other people's money. Um, I guess I'm looking at some of them here today. So if you're saving into uh, an ISA, put some money aside for a pension, wanting to enjoy and wants to stand of living later in life, it's my members who are trying to do their best for you. By investing here in the UK, about 75% of UK households now use the services of an asset manager, somebody who can help you and look forward to a better standard of living in retirement. And, and we do that by deploying that 10 trillion pounds of capital into high growth companies, um, into infrastructure projects that need greater support, by buying government debt and by looking for a long-term return on your investment with certain characteristics that genuinely do go to helping make the world a better place. So as you all know, there has been a sustained and substantial growth in sustainability investing uh, as more institutional and retail clients express strong views around how they want their money to be invested. Um, we manage um, around uh, 10 trillion pounds, but deploy about 1.6 trillion into the UK economy. That means we earn about a third of the FTSE, um, and I'll be happy to say a little bit more about how else we think more finance can go into creating high growth uh, companies, better jobs, and addressing the issues that investors want to see not just here in the UK, but because our industry is so global around the world as well. But I do recognise we've got a particular focus on the UK today. Thank you, James. Oh, Chris, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm just putting on notice. I'm coming back to that 
Uh, my question is later on the high growth companies and uh, what what can be done to, to promote them because uh, there's a high need to, to plug, plug, yeah, plug the SMF, uh, the SMF uh, which is very good for on high growth companies and support them. I think it was last week. Um, uh, well, the reasons of it, so we'll, we'll come back to that. I'm now going to hand over to, uh, to Emily from the FCA to tell us um, how, how can regulation support? Support good growth and all, all these other things, you know, these, these, these wonderful things which we'd like to see happen in the world. Thanks, James. So, my name is Emily Shepherd. I'm the Chief Operating Officer and Executive Director for Authorisations at the Financial Conduct Authority. So, the first thing I'm going to say is that the SEA is changing, so we are looking to transform, and that's transform with a capital T to become more assertive, adaptive, and innovative. And in that context, we, we are sitting on still the second largest global financial hub in the world in the UK. We are unique in the full services. Um, we've got, in 2021, had 14.7 billion pounds of equity was attracted into the UK for UK and international investment. And uh, I think Chris just mentioned 10 trillion assets under management. In 21, it was 11 trillion, but still a significant portfolio of assets under management. We remain number one for international debt issuance and for FX. And on fintech, we have four times as many fintech firms who choose to locate themselves in the UK versus, say, Germany and France. There was slightly more news today saying that we have now beaten San Francisco, but I'm not sure about that one. So the three areas that I think the FCA that I'd like to speak about, if, if questioned, are around strengthening the wholesale markets. For us, I think this is helping the conditions for investment uh, and sustainable growth generally. So we are going to be adapting the listing rules regime. Uh, the draft handbook and CPA is due out later this year. We've also created rules for transparency, which were published in May 23. The second thing a regulator can do is create an environment that supports and encourages innovation. So the FCA were the first regulator globally to create a sandbox. That sandbox is now 24-7. We've gone further though. So the Khalifa Review talked about having a nursery or some sort of environment to help and support new business types, new firms and high growth firms like FinTechs in that regulatory journey. So we have created our early high growth oversight function, which is now just celebrated its first year. And the final piece there is on sprints. So we work with the industry and support on creating sprints um, to solve specific questions, specific problems in the industry, or even on policy, we have policy sprints too. The final thing is standards. So standards is something that sets the UK apart. We've got really strong standards. Uh, we are looking at the way that we are now approaching them. So for example, consumer duty. So consumer duty is a very different way of, of Adding those standards. This is outcomes based. So we're putting the control back into the boardroom. There is a member of the board who is responsible for consumer duty and they have to think through things like value for money. It doesn't mean there's a race to the bottom. Value for money in investment terms means you are paying for what you get. The return has to be good if you have high charges. So the last piece of standards, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about authorizations. Now, authorizations is one of those areas that had, well, it was in trouble two years ago. The queues and authorizations were incredibly long. Uh, and that's where we have really listened to industry. We've listened to what you want, what you need, and we've invested, and we're now down 60% on that queue time, or the queue in total over the last two years. So for example, changing control, uh, we now act on those within 48 hours. Uh, senior management regime, senior management function, it was taking about six months for somebody to get approved, authorised. It can take three weeks if someone comes who is ready, willing and organised. So we've made massive improvements already on authorisations and we're now digitising it. Uh, so we went live last week with our first form there with many more to come. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I have a feeling um, that we all quite, well, my figure is quite, I know we'll come around to talk about consumer duty um, and money because I'm going to ask you about it, but I suspect that um, I suspect people in the audience are not going to get into that as well. Um, our next speaker um, is a practitioner in the, uh, also a practitioner in the investment, uh, uh, investment world, uh, Tracy Blackwell, CEO of Entry the Trust Corporation. 
Hi, and thank you. Um, sorry, I hope this, uh, I've been drafted in the last minute, so hopefully this all comes out the right way. <laughs> so Pension Insurance Corporation um, is uh, one of the leaders in the bulk annuity buyout space, and everybody goes, what is that? Um, and basically what we're doing is consolidating uh, final salary defined benefit pension schemes and have done so in consolidating by about 250 over the last uh, 15 years, and we manage between uh, 40 and 50 billion pounds of assets. Um, and as a result, uh, when those DD schemes come over to us, we're big investors in the real economy. So we invest in things like uh, social housing, university accommodation, uh, wind farms, solar, uh, private sector built to rent, uh, and all of those things that, that are the other bits of productive investments. I think a lot of the conversation that's been going on recently has been, been about productive investment just being about fintech or growth capital or um, or life science, but actually actually building the infrastructure of the country uh, is incredibly important. And we look at that as kind of a form of intergenerational transfer. We're using people's pensions today to build the infrastructure of the future, and that's incredibly important. Um, what I what I kind of would say about uh, you know Chris mentioned five trillion of savings uh, that, that's managed by UK asset managers. About five trillion of that is is the UK is UK savings. Um, and the question I think that everyone's asking is why aren't those savings being used to support the real economy? And what can we do to get more of of that savings directed into into supporting the UK? And I think it's, there's two different questions. Um, and, I, and, and sometimes they get conflated. So one is just about the structure of some of these industries. So in that five trillion, there's different industries. There's defined benefit pension schemes, there's defined contribution schemes, there's local authority schemes, there's personal savings through things like SIP, ISIS, et cetera. And all have different barriers and reasons why more of it isn't invested in the UK. Um, and we need to look at each one of those uh, separately and individually to, to, to think about what we can do to make it uh, more attractive and easier uh, and have those barriers to uh, to invest in the UK. A session I was at earlier, somebody said it's easier to invest as a retail investor in crypto in the UK than it is to buy a mutual fund or a, you know a a, 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 a a usage or whatever it is. Um, and that's not the right thing to do. Or to buy a share. Plus, there's uh, there's tax on um, on buying those shares, which probably isn't very helpful either. Where it's not on crypto. So that's. Um, that's problem number one. Problem number two, though, is how do we make the UK a more attractive place to invest in? Um, and that's regulatory, it's corporate governance, it's about um, tax policy, there's a whole bunch of other things. And we shouldn't conflate those two things. Uh, we should think about each of those separately um, and free up investments uh, where we can all invest our pensions in the UK, but also look at what makes the UK an attractive or not attractive place to invest in. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, that's clear in the stage, perfectly cool. Yeah, yeah, you for, for going there. I, I said I wasn't going to give everyone a uh, biography, but I will, uh, I will yeah, point out that he's also a former practitioner in this space who used to used to manage, manage and invest money sustainably. So uh, yeah, it's a, uh, I attempted to say a very example of the generation who knows the area he's talking about. Because all, all, of, all of our speakers are, all of the speakers are, are, are experts. But yeah, yeah Karen, so how does how does the one mesh with? Government policy in your agenda for agenda for growth. Okay, James. Well, thank you for that introduction. I think um, very kind to have me here today. As you say, um, you know, I come into politics from quite a long and happy career in financial services and investments. So this is a, a subject close to my heart. But as Exchequer Secretary, I have responsibility for economic growth and productivity within the Treasury, uh, and within that, infrastructure and energy policy. And so um, the first thing to say about mobilizing private capital and creating an environment for business investment is that we're starting from a very strong base. Uh, we are the second uh, in, the, in the world, sorry, when it comes to attracting foreign direct investment stock. The only country that does it better than us is the United States. And I think that's a point that's often appreciated. We have some of the world's leading academic institutions. We've got a world leading and long standing legal framework that's adopted in many countries around the world. Our regulators are some of the strongest uh, and robust uh, that the world has ever seen. Uh, we have the advantage of a time zone that is attractive to investors from overseas. And we have the English language. So, unlike a lot of countries around the world, actually, we're starting from a really strong, strong base. Um, but clearly, the first thing that we need to do. 
uh, in terms of making sure that the business investment environment is strong, is ensure that we have a strong and robust, sustainable economy. And that's why the priority of this government at the moment is to get inflation down, to really bear down on inflation is the number one priority of the Prime Minister. It's in a downward trajectory, but there's longer to go on that. And of course, as part of that, once we tackle inflation, we can start to grow economy even more than it is already. We know that we were one of the fastest to grow outside out of the pandemic and we're growing faster than Germany, Italy and France, but obviously we want to go far uh, further on that. In terms of what we can specifically do beyond management, you know, basic management of the economy and getting inflation down and growth up, we need to ensure uh, that we have a competitive fiscal environment. That's why we've got the lowest corporation tax in the G7. That's why we've got the most generous uh, system of capital allowances in the OECD. It's why we've vastly expanded our R&D tax credits uh, to be one of the most competitive in the world. So the effective rate of taxation when it comes to business investment is uh, genuinely one of the uh, leaders in the world and one of the most attractive. But as businesses will tell us frequently, it isn't just about taxes. It's about access to a skilled workforce, and I've mentioned our academic institutions, but the reskilling of uh, our workforce is also a vital component uh, to this. It's also important to create the mechanisms across the world through trade links to ensure that we have a free flowing of trade, and that's why uh, things like CPTPP, with the fastest growing nations in the world, why bilateral trade-specific agreements like those that we have with Singapore, for example, are really genuinely going to make a significant um, difference. And finally, it's about putting in place the market mechanisms to ensure that we can mobilize more private capital. On energy, we have the contract difference uh, system, which has essentially transformed our offshore wind to make us the world's leader in offshore wind uh, capabilities. We've got the UK Infrastructure Bank, which has a target of mobilising up to £40 billion pounds of private capital investment into our infrastructure. We've got the British Business Bank, who have patient capital, who have a goal and are doing really well at mobilising private capital investment for the fastest growing com companies in the country. And as already been mentioned, the Mansion House Compact, which will essentially tap the trillions of pounds that are held in pension funds but have been historically underinvested in fast growing companies and real assets that will make a transformative impact i think in terms of making sure there's more capital going into the things that we uh, we want and to make sure that the investment environment is one that is not just returns focused but you know it is is achieving something which we haven't historically done before, which is to take on more risk in a pragmatic and reasonable way to ensure that pensions have a better return, but also that the investment projects that need financing have access to more additional capital. So I'll leave it there, James. Thanks, Thanks questions. very much, Jeremy. I'm, I'm definitely not sure. I'm sure that we will, if they don't mind, will come back to that question of uh, returns. Um, but before I do that, before I'm, I'm, I've, used, I've used my program as chair, for allowing all of you to ask your much better questions than I was back on my own. Uh, to all of the panel, actually. Um, and it's about, it's about consumers, or about individuals or individual owners. Because Chris stopped there talking about other people's money. And he's running one day, it's not other people's money. It's, it's our money. It's all, it's, this is, somebody owns this money somewhere. And there's a theme across all of your comments in different ways um, about how, and whether or not, how you can, if we should, make changes in policy and practice to engage the owners of that money more in the choice, the allocation of their money. So um, if Tracy said it's currently too hard, people have a beautiful choice of where the money goes, uh, and it talks about the union constitution, Gareth works for politicians, he works for the voters, he wants to, he wants to give them you know, so you've got different choices in freedom. Um, so uh, I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to write you some of Chris. Chris, how do we, how do we need to, should we, how do we make sure that people who own the money, the women who are controlling, that they have more control, more engagement, more, more say over where it goes to go with you? Um, what's, the, what's the answer to that one? So I'm, for me, this is the profound question, and we just got to get this right. 
because we live in an age of reckless prudence. Well, actually, what we've been through um, for years now is that sense of disempowerment, um, where people just don't think about their savings, get worried about them saving uh, uh, their pension, um, is something that, that somebody else worries about. Um, we had a great, uh, a really significant public policy intervention called auto enrollment, which was that rarest of thing, government initiative that actually worked and made a, made a big difference to our nation. Far more people now save for a pension than ever before, but not at a high enough rate. And my worry is that actually in 20 years' time, many people will look back and think, hang on, the government told me it had sorted out my pension, but I'm looking at pension of poverty. All I can see is a retirement where I'll have to retire later and work hard. We've, uh, so we've had reckless prudence from a policy-making point of view. We've also been through a period where actually the narrative has been around investor protection, consumer protection, and people have been protected against engaging with their own money. Now, we're all consumers, we all spend money, we, we make a decision every single day you know, do you, when you want to buy a cup of coffee, which coffee shop do you go in? Is that driven because of your values or the cost of the, co of the coffee? Um, but we don't apply the same thing when it comes to thinking about our retirement <clears throat> and, and directing where you want that money to go. So you can decide to walk into shop A, but actually as an investor, as a saver, as an investor, you could own some of shop A. Or if shop A isn't to your banking, you could say, I don't want to invest in shop A, I want my pension investment to go to retail outlet B. <clears throat> and so we need to start engaging all of us as savers and investors. So I want to see the language of regulation move on from consumer protection to, in, to consumer engagement. That's the only way we're going to fix this because it will be a matter of no consequence if we tell people they have options to do one thing or another if they're not the slightest bit engaged with it. So we need to start more at an earlier age of helping people understand that the government won't provide for you uh, a good term of living retirement. Your current employer has other things that they can be doing for you rather than thinking about providing for you in retirement. But the risk is with you as an individual more than ever before, and that is not going to change. So we need to get people engaged in this subject not protected from it, but engaged with it. So that is the profound difference. And we need to move the conversation on from the only thing we look at is cost, because cost is easy to see, but to value, that's the risk, that's the return generated after costs, because this is your money. So asking bigger questions about value to live rather than cost on the way in um, is hugely important. And then we can talk, start talking to people about products and solutions. But really, if you've got a shop that nobody even wants to walk in, it really doesn't matter how you rearrange the, the, the products on the shelf. James, can I just talk about the engagement thing please, for a second? Please, please, please. Not a positive, from a positive perspective, because you know we, we are sitting at a, a, the biggest shift in how long-term savings are managed in this country in a generation. It is profound. It's not hyperbole. That is what's happening. So. DB schemes are closed. They're not going to. It's not going to happen again. They're moving into the insurance world. We're going to invest in infrastructure. Great. Um, DC, as as Chris said, is is you know the future. Uh, we'll need to save more into that. Contribution levels must go up for people to have secure retirements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so so all of that uh, makes perfect sense. Um, how do we engage people to um, to engage with their pensions and to really look at what they're doing to take responsibility for? So I sit on the board of the ABI Association of British Insurers, and last year we ran a campaign called Pension Attention. Actually, we've just done the second round now. Uh, where we had a rapper called Big Zoo, I never heard of him, you guys may have, I didn't, um, who won the BAFTA last year, and he did a rap called Pension Attention. And it was absolutely brilliant. If you haven't seen it, you need to go out there. And 20% of the population saw it, not people like us, probably, uh, but through TikTok, etc. Are there any Big Zoo fans? Are there any Big Zoo fans in here? No. You know what Big Zoo I know, I know. But of those, 20% of the population, obviously of the younger generation saw it, 90% went and engaged with their pension and did something. That is, that is amazing. And I think perhaps we just need to have a slightly, dare I say it, the, the younger generation has a different 
way to engage than our generation does. And we need to think about the world that way in order to get them to engage. But I'm really, really positive um, because I've seen the outcome of it. Um, and in the UK, we had the Tell Sid campaign at the, yeah. at the launch of the privatization drive, and everybody in the country understood right. on Tell Sid. Exactly right. Did you take care of the question about popular capitalism? <laughs> at the end of it, but before we get there, um, I want to come to Andrew because I mean, you've heard a lot, of, you've clearly, I'm curious to know your, your, your thoughts on Chris's point particularly there. You've heard the, the, the argument that you're in your well meaning design to do your job, you're, you're protecting people from choice, you're protecting people out of out of engagement. Is that is that is that fair? It's not quite how I would say what Chris said, but you, you surprised me. And that's so um I've only been regulated for two and a half years. And before then I, I was also in industry as Chris knows because I used to sit down tables with him. So Chris talked about disempowerment. And disempowerment and that leading to things like the water enrollment legislation that had to come to to force people to effectively enroll by default uh, into pensions unless they voted out so for me the, the conversation is around financial inclusion uh, and that education piece now it, it, it doesn't actually belong to the fca this it belongs to maps as a responsibility as a remit but we are there to help support our fellow regulators in, in getting the messages out. So financial inclusion, um, the failure, if you like, of financial inclusion means that part of the consumer duty is to simplify the language, to make sure that people understand what it is they're buying in, in very plain English, to stop some of the barriers, some of those sludge practices. And as I said right at the beginning, it's about value for money. It's not a race of what value for money and the control of the translation of consumer duty belongs to the board it belongs to the firm for the firm to see what is right for their customers their clients and to set their standards this is an outcome to the regulation it's a very different way of doing it so it doesn't automatically fail to save everything it's not so much about putting a big safety net and never letting any consumer fail uh, in an investment it's, it's important that investments do go up as well as down um, but that's where we we are playing in. Thank you. Um, we may um, this time. I may ask you about like, some guidance later on. Um, I have a theory copy of mine, but I'm not, I'm not going to go up now. I'm going to go and get gas. I want to put you from a from a voter perspective. Yeah, and, and remember, we are we are yeah, SMS cross party think tank. But we're we're in a conservative party conference. Um, any thoughts from a, from a conservative perspective on this? Is there you know, should the conservative party be aiming for a popular capitalism where we are all a little bit more American, a little bit Australian in our attitudes, where we think, you know, this is my money, I'm going to manage it, I'm going to you know, take responsibility. Is this, is this, is this, well, there was a lady who went this party once one time, I had thoughts on that stuff. I, I forget her name. So, a conservative view of consumer, the consumers in investment. I, I can tell you my view. I think it's 1929, Mill Skelton wrote a piece about property owning democracy and over the decades that translated into different things for different prime ministers for Margaret Thatcher who you allude to that was about owning your own home but I think an under appreciated aspect of having a stake in the economy and, and you know essentially owning a part of our future prosperity that has been underplayed is our is to do with our savings and participation in the markets and investment products and um, you know Chris mentioned auto enrollment we have completely underplayed the success of that 10 million people are now saving for a pension that we didn't save before the other aspect that's underplayed is the fact that it was genuinely cross-party consensus and achievement where it wasn't the usual ding dong across the house commons chamber we all agree that this is a good thing that's why we've recently extended it to 18 to 22 year olds, which is something as a backbench on these panels I consistently hoped we would do and now we are doing because one thing that that will achieve is instilling in a very early age this mindset about saving for a retirement, even if it may be decades away, the compounding effect of saving for a retirement will be uh, potentially transformative and make you more independent of not just of the state but financially independent in later life and more uh, more secure but we do have to do other things to change the culture of saving the, the culture of risk-taking 
I think the fact that we've now got over 70 billion pounds in ISA products is really important. And they've been a real success story too. And we can go further with that. But there are other aspects, like, for example, when you apply for a, a job or there's a job advert, job adverts is a great example where typically it'll mention the salary, but it won't mention the pension or offer. And that can be almost a third of the total compensation that you will get. So it's things like that that I think, you know, employers have a role to play. And we all have a role to play in ensuring that we foster this um, culture. The overarching theme, though, and thing that we can do the most of is, is to ensure that there's transparency um, so that people can see where their money's invested, see what is available to them in the first place. And simplicity, I think, is the other aspect where some people just feel like they just can't access these products or they don't know how to. And so if we can find a way in which we are more transparent and offer simplicity in the product offering in particular, I think we can make a lot of progress to what we want to achieve, which is ultimately to have more people having a stake in our economy. And that way, as conservatives, I would argue that if they've got a greater stake in the economy, they'll pay greater attention to economic policies and they won't be voting for a party that will rack up debt, fuel more inflation, and uh, run the economy in an unsustainable way. Now, before I go to the audience, there's a question about the government. There were a couple of journalists in the media who were almost pinning you down for one particular aspect of what you just talked about, which was that point on job ads and pension, you know, pension information on job ads. Just to go to you, your, your, your view is that. Employers should be including essential provisions on the face of the job. Of, of, of the job. That, that should become, it would be good if that was, if that was the norm to have a salary plus, plus pension provision at some point. I was making an observation that it's interesting <laughs> that that doesn't happen. And if it is possible to include that information, then that would be an interesting thing for, for a potential employee to know what the total compensation package is. If we're talking today about how we get more people focused on saving for uh, retirement, knowing what you're going into in terms of the pension offer would seem to me like a pretty straightforward thing to be um, to be aware of. Obviously, we can ask about it in interviews, but it's just an interesting observation that a lot of ads don't include that. Well, you, you won't say I will. You know what the shoot for pension he does in the intro ads. Uh, well, I'm going to start taking some questions, so if you have a question, put four in the air. Um, I will just say, as a, um, as a as I am a recovering journalist, I have a strong aversion to people making speeches on these things. So if you're going to make a speech, please pretend, raise the thing, you want to pretend it's a question. So I'm going to start by the front row there. Um, uh, I don't, do we have a working mic? I don't know. I guess I do. Um, no, just shout, just shout, it's fine. If, if anyone can't hear, let me know if you can't hear questions, I'll, I'll repeat them. Hi, so Anne from Hobby Sunsail. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of the comments. Um, I noticed Emily mentioned investors can go up and down, and Gary talked about the power of long-term compounding. There's a sort of question there to me around what is the messaging of putting in disclosures at the point where we're trying to encourage people to invest for the first time? If we're saying you're going to lose all your money tomorrow, we well, you shouldn't be investing for you tomorrow. So are you, are you with your outcomes Place approach, are you going to be looking at that disclosure regime to think about how we behave and drive the right? So, so that's a narrow question to 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 the line, which I'm bring a wider question to everybody else, which is how to strike the tone to, to the white problem. Is that what that would be? Yeah. So, maybe, 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 maybe. No, it's a, so it's an interesting notion. I mean, the consumer duty is, is new, it, it only came in at the end of July, it only applies to new products at the moment. Uh, come next July, will apply across the board. So I don't think there are any views at the moment in changing the, that specific disclosure, but I'm always interested, or we are always interested in, in our ideas, if you think that that is the thing that is stopping people investing. I think that there's a sort of reality as well of you know, the context of the economic environment at the moment. We are still in a cost of living situation, I'll try to call it crisis, but a, a situation there, and people do not necessarily have that spare money to invest at the moment. Um, Chris, are we, are we, are we yes. do more on that? Is, is the regulatory messaging too doom laden? Is that for people, people investing in? So I think, um, I think as a nation, we, we need a conversation about risk because we've been locked in a, a discussion where we prioritise safetyism more than anything else, and, and it comes back to the point I make about. Um, 
protecting people from themselves. There are people who have money to save. There are people who have money to invest. And uh, I applaud the speeches by uh, the FCA where they've highlighted people who've sat on cash rather than uh, taking more sensible investment strategies. You know, it's possible today to get into debt almost friction-free, taking out credit cards. It's easy to make by crypto. Um, much harder than, take, than investing in, in your ISA. Um, so it's not a level playing field, and the answer to that isn't, isn't to level up, by the way, and it's just further regulation. Um, it's, it's for us to have a more, a more grown up discussion and to understand that protecting people from taking risk is a huge risk. It's, no risk is actually risk itself. And, and I think we've just got the equation wrong, and, and I think we do need to have a more grown up discussion with people because nobody else is going to do it for them. And that's been a big game changer with, with the closure of the vast majority of DB schemes into DC and the and, and just the number of typical jobs that people will have these days. So, so I uh, so my own view, stress own view, is that a, a review of disclosure, which moves us away from an analog paper-based system full of all the risks to a just-in-time behavioral cycle, psychology informed nudge-based system, used, making use of technology will just encourage people to look after themselves better and then we'll need to worry less about risk and protection and a lot more about how regulation can encourage um, engagement which is what, what I'm sure we all want to see. So you, you, you're not in the affirmative for that. No, I think it, uh, you know, um, the, the whole risk-based culture, which goes through the entire economy, not just in terms of investments, is incredibly important and I think it's a very, very good points you make about the disclosure because all of it you know you listen to an ad on tv and it's all too late you know uh, investments can go down as well as up which is all great but how about if you're not saving enough for your retirement you're not going to have an appropriate retirement um is also incredibly important yes, exactly um, exactly gareth um, you mentioned the mentioned house earlier on is, is mentioning house and that push towards more risk taking and a focus on returns is that in tension with uh, protecting, you know, protecting people from, from risk. Is there, how do you reconcile those two things? I think it's based on appreciation that as a country, our pensioners have typically been underinvested on an overall asset allocation basis to um, faster growing companies, lower down the spectrum in terms of um, you know, the, the size of those companies. I think more broadly, I would observe that there's been an underinvestment in real assets, in infrastructure, in private equity, in venture capital, while we've created some mechanisms to help investors access, for example, the venture capital. Um, I think we could go further. And so the overall observation is that we need to do more to ensure that pensioners have access to higher returning assets. And yes, that does mean where appropriate, there is additional risk but as chris pointed out sometimes not taking more risk is riskier than not doing it, it itself and so just sitting on cash for decades is obviously not going to help you when it comes to retirement and obviously each in, each individual will have to take their own advice and uh, far be it for me to or offer guidance. investment advice and investments do go up as well as uh, down over the long period uh, but uh, the overall uh, objective that we're seeking to achieve is to ensure that pensioners have a more secure and prosperous retirement while we're also able to unlock assets that have been under allocated to the things that we want to boost investment in. Um, next, next question, I'm going to go to Jenna Corwin, Corwin, second group. Um, is that all right? Uh, so Jenna Sattler from the Institute of Government. Um, there's only been a very brief mention of tax in this whole event so far. I was wondering what your views are on it's quite a lot of features of the tax system that try and incentivize one form of investment or another. Um, do you think that's working well? I suppose my question is a little bit harder. If you couldn't do a net tax cut, would you refocus the current tax incentives differently to achieve more of the kind of investment you were? Tax pro investment tax policy in 30, 30 um, easy subject. Um, who wants to go first on that? Um, oh, I, I can kind of go first. Um, you know, and this is actually slightly a, a question as well as a, 
you know, there's about 800 billion pounds sitting in SIPs, uh, individual investment accounts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So for anybody to invest, and, and a lot of people probably in this room have those sorts of things, um, for people like us to invest in those high growth companies, high growth things, venture, private equity, it's almost impossible. And one of the things that makes it almost impossible is the, is all of the tax, now it's not the tax system, it's the disclosures and all of the rigmarole around it. And I think the stuff to make sure that people aren't skipping tax, so to speak, and trying not trying to find a way around the tax system actually acts as a break. It's another layer of stuff that you just have to do where people eventually just give up. And so it's not just it's not just the level of tax I think that we need to look at. It's all the stuff that goes around you having to declare tax and, and what you're doing and that makes it more difficult. Um, I would look at again the ICER regime I think it's become overly complex. I think there should be yeah. greater incentives for um, uh, for you just call stocks and shares answers than, uh, than their cash equivalent, a return to the pep Tessa regime, because that actually encourages people to start saving a little in cash and then as they get exposed to risk, then they can move into more of a, a risk based environment. So it's a, a ladder there, I think it's tremendous. Um, just a bit of a plug uh, we've done some work looking at the cost of the UK of not having a VAT zero fund regime. Um, our major competitors have a VAT zero regime, looks as though Dublin. Um, quite straightforwardly, for every billion pounds domiciled, it throws off about a million pounds in tax take. Seems like a no-brainer, but the problem is, if you're looking actually at the um, at the future benefits of future tax take, as against any margin reduction in tax take immediately, and I think we get lost in that sometimes as a country. What's the net present value um, of future future tax tax take? Bear in mind. So, those are a couple of recommendations for me. We are consciously open to statements approaching this may This may just condition what you say, but within, within those confines. Yeah, I would just point out, as I did right at the beginning, if I take it in two parts business investment and personal investment. So, from a business investment standpoint, first thing to say is it's not always all about tax as I laid out. There's lots of other different factors that determine whether a business will invest or reinvest its profits. But when it does want to reinvest its profits and can, uh, we have an incredibly generous uh, capital allowances scheme in the UK, which is the most generous in the OECD. So it is very competitive. If you want to reinvest those profits, you can reduce your overall corporation tax uh, burden. But also, uh, we've expanded uh, the R&D tax credits as well, which ensures that firms, again, that want to invest in R&D can do so in a tax efficient manner. For individuals, as I pointed out, you know, it is right to highlight the success of ISA products. You know, we're always looking at the efficiency of those products and providers obviously look at them every day, but that is a, a very proven, very successful way of saving day-to-day, um, -day, whether cash or in stocks and shares, or whatever it is, in a tax efficient way. And for the higher growing uh, companies, that is lower down the capital spectrum, ECTs and EIS, that is a, that's a pretty uh, robust scheme as well. So I would argue that there's already the mechanisms and incentives in place to boost investment and all that activity. Um, right, yes, uh, I'll go over two questions on this side together. I don't know if that would be a good answer. I'm just going to get to them. Um, no, no, you start your question. I probably yeah. do well. Yeah, okay. Well, no, okay. Well, then, and then, and then the gentleman in the. Uh, I'd say, is that, is that green or blue? Blue, I thought we were out of the Yes. Yeah, so, then, 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 then. Nigel, people the pillar say workplace pensions body. Um, partly building on the last couple of questions, actually, about regulation and tax. And I'm interested in the panel's thoughts on what regulatory and tax changes could be done to encourage and draw greater pensions uh, and other savings investment into the UK. And we sort of covered them, in, in my view. Um, maybe some kind of fiscal incentive for funds to invest in UK companies, pension funds to do so. And you know, secondly, we've already talked about it, a the contributions lever. It's terrific. The government has actually stepped forward on broadening out a a bit, first pound savings and 18, but there's more to do. So I just wonder if these things or others are things the panel can comment on. Right. Let me start by saying that over the last three years, the FC has done a much better job of engaging, so that's that's appreciated. 
Um, at the same time, I think we have a fundamental problem, and that, that's that we're shifting from historically regulators and protected people from themselves. Now we're trying to shift to educating them so that they can do a better job. That, that's, that's a hard shift. Um, but one of the problems that I see carrying on from what Chris said is that we have we also have a problem with proxy votes. Proxy votes are not being voted as the as the investor would invest. They're being voted as the, the money manager would invest. And, and, they, and that, that also is a problem, and that's going to require engagement. Um, how, how do we fix that problem? And is it being looked at to be fixed? Okay. So that's um, I mean, that is a possible question if I very you better pension investment and engagement, and then, uh, then the proxy. Should, should, should we start with, probably, with, with, with proxies? Um, we start with that first. Maybe you're nodding it. Um, there's, there's technology on the way it's, it will help. Help democratize uh, your democratize shareholder voting. Um, there is, and this is um, speaking as the investment industry, uh, something that we, we know we need to be a lot closer to the asset owners on actually. So, um, uh, it, in terms of setting the, the mandate, um, we need to be really clear does, is this an asset owner that is relying on the discretion of their asset manager to, uh, to vote the shares? Um, how do we sort out the problem of proxy voters with it, a proxy um, uh, where it's just a box ticking exercise and that really doesn't help anybody? Um, and certainly, there is a misalignment that's crept in, which is between the asset owner, the asset manager, the proxy, the proxy service that's being used, um, all of which is making what should be um, uh, stewardship should be a conducive process to help changing businesses becoming really aggressive. And actually, um, deeply unhelpful. So, at an institutional level, um, I know there are, there are new systems being introduced, and even at a retail level, what we're interested in is much more of an open discussion. But, yeah, I, we can't stay where we have been because it's not a, a good outcome for anyone. And there's a regulatory view of the follow up proxy question. Well, as Chris said, so um, when you're looking at the direct asset owner or the underlying asset owner, um, Legally, we can look at that direct asset owner. So, so it is around often the fund manager who has the vote because it's a discretionary fund. Um, so, it's not something that we are extremely focused on at the moment. I think it would probably potentially fall under consumer duty again if this came up. So, it is about how you know how a firm sets its behavior to its consumers and maybe it's a differentiator in the future a differentiator for a firm to say that they are going to represent you not just the fund manager in those proxy votes um gary i mean you could you have you can a few thoughts and problems proxy question but also if you can then take us on the seamless segue onto the on uh, nigel's questions about more more beavers you can pull to Increase pension uh, pension savers in yeah, engagement and yeah. uh, investment risks. Yeah, I think as it is, it's not in my portfolio. I'm willing really to stray a little bit. I'm not. Uh, I think I'll leave that to to our great regulators. Um, yeah, I think I think I'll leave that to to our great regulator on the panel to 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 opine on. But feel I say a great question in terms of how you you know can guide or encourage more investment into our domestic market. You'll know that over many decades, the allocation to our domestic market from our domestic pensions has been in decline. Uh, and, and that really is a long-standing trend. I think you know, there's a couple of things there. One, we're not going to make anybody do anything. That's not appropriate. Um, pension funds have fiduciary responsibility to ensure the best possible financial return. And it's a global market, so we appreciate that. I think what we can do is ensure that there's enough projects for them to be able to invest in. And, uh, and enough viable investment projects and companies uh, that are accessible to pension funds. So I would just point you to some of the work that the British Business Bank are doing, uh, doing fantastic work through British um, patient capital in particular for accessing investments into higher growing companies, but also we've got the, I think now two-year-old uh, UK infrastructure bank uh, run by uh, John Flynn, who is really trying to use uh, seed government capital to mobilize, as I said at the beginning, more private capital by having a pipeline of projects that government and private capital can help fund. And I think those kind of mechanisms are quite interesting for being able to uh, shift more pension fund assets into domestic investments. But as a treasury, we're always looking for ideas and, and ways in which we can, um, we can help facilitate an environment which more domestic investment can go into domestic assets. 
Um, do you want to know what sorts of pensions come for it before I go on to the side of the room? Uh, yeah, if I could just about the UK domestic investment. So, so uh, as I said what, in my opening remarks, a lot of this stuff is being completed. There is, uh, the, you know, UK DD pension schemes are not going to invest in UK equities. They're closed, they're closed to new members. That game is, is passed. Um, but even in open schemes, and there are a few open schemes, not that many, about the 700,000 odd members of open schemes, about 450,000 of them are in two schemes, which is USS and RELPEN. If you look at those schemes, which are open and therefore investing in growth assets, they don't invest in the UK. Um, they invest in MSCI World Index or overseas uh, private equity funds or venture capital funds. So it comes back to the first bit I talked about, which is, there's a structure issue and that structure is changing, but there's a, how do we make the UK an, uh, an attractive place to invest? And clearly, even the investors who have all the incentives in the world to invest in the UK aren't investing in the UK, and we have to ask ourselves why that is. Yeah, and, um, just, just very briefly on this, the government is doing some of the right things here. Um, the MIFID research requirement being, being uh, unwound. Um, you know, there is a reason why uh, high growth companies go to the US, it's because they, they meet research analysts who actually understand the intricacies of their business. The way that we introduced the MIFID research rules in the UK, as a broadcast at the time, completely decimated the UK based research industry. So we lack the ecosystem of detailed research analysts to have the discussions with those high growth companies. Um, I am sincerely hopeful that, that we're going to do a rebirth of the research industry in a different format pick for the 21st century here in the UK, but it's about getting the underpinnings right um, so that we can create that richer IPO, high growth environment, which um, will then create a magnet to attract exactly the type of investment that we all want to see. Five minutes left, I'm trying to get at least one question, two questions right, so uh, both on the aisle, like maybe there and then the gentleman behind, behind you. Do, 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 do you have your one by one, and we'll give you crisp uh, incisive answers on the board will be on our next day. So. Okay, just quick. Um, I'm Sam from the Finance Innovation Lab at the Group Organization the Fair Bank and Bull Campaign. So I just wanted to bring us back to Tracy's point very much on the big economy earlier on, patient capital, financial inclusion, short term savings, and very much trying to get some people engaged with their money. So there are a group of financial institutions that are very close to their customers and communities. Brilliant work in supporting their members and customers to save, and by lending, particularly within what deprived areas, they make a huge impact in terms of creating new businesses and jobs. I'm thinking of credit unions and communities of development finance institutions. And, and the question about credit unions is? Well, they themselves face huge barriers to scaling their operations and having the impact that they know they would have. So is it time for a Fair Banking Act, the equivalent of a community investment act in the States, that would require mainstream banks, community finance providers, and the regulator yeah, to you. work together so that communities can get the investment they need to Lovely. Thank you. And you're going behind. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, this from this, the description here says um, uh, of the event, this is generating um, GDP and growth and creating jobs. My question to you, sir. Um, uh, Mr. Davis, it is, uh, I work for a small organization connecting London with the Arab and uh, scrapping the tax free shopping. Uh, I work with too many brands in London. They all suffer in, in this summer because there's no customers. Everyone goes to Paris buy, and that's actually pushing investors away from London. Is the tax free shopping tax -free shop. something that you need to look at? You're more investors to London. You're more than three jobs in the side of the event. You're going to have to share very badly in terms of the jobs. So I'm like, I apologize. Um, I think, I think those are actually both of the guys. Those are three questions. Three questions for the camera. Oh, I'm delighted they're questions for the camera. Fair back to you. Fair back to you. Yes, or no. And what are the options? Yeah, I'm going to go first. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. 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 Thank we're very fortunate that we've got a very diverse financial services sector. And a big part of it is the role that mutuals play and global societies and you know banks that are based in communities and doing amazing work. They've been one of the key drivers for the take-up of ISIS. I spoke at an event in the House of Commons just recently making that very point. Whether we need I, I'm not familiar with the, the, the proposed uh, legislation, but I would argue that I think we've already got a pretty diverse um, 
system that is proven and uh, successful. And I would argue that actually some of the big banks, the very big global banks, have amazing community operations and are making a real difference to local businesses and individuals in those communities. So um, that's what I would say about that. But on the tax-free shopping, another area that's not in my portfolio, I would um, But you're, you're on for it, you would tell. But I do know uh, that the analysis that was done at the time that was introduced to show that it would have a minimal impact on visitors to London. We always keep taxes under review and we'd be happy to see any specific evidence that it is precluding business investment or tourists to the UK. Very happy to receive that. All taxes under review shops. as always. Sorry? Speak to London High Street shops. Look, provide us with the evidence, we will always keep taxes under review. Thank you. Um, and with that, the clock has now kicked over to 12 o'clock, which means that I am going to bring the event to a close. Um, by saying thank you, everybody, I would say thank you to all of you for coming. And I would say thank you to the panel, especially the Investment Association, for making this uh, this possible. And especially, 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 um, for our hand of applause for our uh, for the minister of the Health, you know very well how busy this year of our conference was very, very good, guys, and today, giving us some exciting thoughts. So, thank you.